Okay, so our next topic in our unit, Mix and Flow of Matter, is buoyancy. So this is topic six. And so buoyancy is defined as the tendency for materials to rise or float in a fluid. And when we talk about buoyant force, that's the upward force that's exerted on objects submerged in fluids. So for example, um, when we look at our blood, the blood in our new our, our blood in our bloodstream, um, there are nutrients that are being transported in the bloodstream. Um, in air, um, pollen is being floated in air. Um, boats and planes are moving around the world. Um, they are boats are moving through liquids. Uh, planes are moving through air or gases. Um, the anti-gravity force. So um, this buoyant force that we're talking about, it's the anti-gravity force because it's against gravity. So buoyancy, um, it refers to the ability of a fluid to support an object floating in or on the fluid. And remember, fluids can be either liquids or gases. So when something is floating, um, that's hap what's happening is an object um, does not fall in air or sink in water, but it remains suspended in the fluid. Um, so what's happening is the particles of a fluid, they exert a force in the opposite direction of the force of gravity. And remember, gravity is the, the downward pull. Um, so by the buoyant force is pushing up um, away from Earth. And it is still measured in newtons, just like any other force. Um, forces are measured in the unit newtons shown as capital N. Okay, so just continuing here, um, looking at average density next. So um, we're talking about ships or, or objects that are made out of steel. So if we think about ships that are built from steel, that, that steel has a density of 9.06 grams per centimeters cubed but why are they able to float so the reason is is that they have these large hollow hulls um, so those large hollow hulls they ensure that the average density is less than the water and remember that the density of water is one um, gram per liter so when we talk about average density that's the total mass of all substances on board divided by the total volume um, if we think about life jackets, they work in a similar way, right? So life jackets, they lower a person's average density. That's what allows us to float when we wear life jackets. Um, they're filled with a substance of very low density. Um, many fluids like air, salt water, and petroleum are solutions that contain more than one pure substance. So the density of the solution is its average density. All right, what are the benefits of average density? So when objects have an average density, we can, um, we can control whether or not they will sink or float. So think of things like um, submarines, for example, um, blimps, hot air balloons, and so on. Um, so it enables objects that would otherwise sink, like large ships, ships and oil rigs. It'll it'll um, make sure that they float. It also helps floating objects to sink. So, for example, in fish, this example here, um, this diagram here of the fish, they have an organ inside called a swim bladder. It's either called a swim bladder or it's called an air bladder, and it basically contains a mixture of air and water. So the fish's depth depends on how much air is in the sac. Um, an increase of air will cause <clears throat> the fish to rise, as shown here, and decreased air will cause the fish to sink. Okay, and it's similar to a submarine. Um, depth control structure is adapted in the submarine to adjust its depth underwater. Um, and like I said, blimps and hot air balloons um, use this as well, use this concept. Okay, next is Archimedes' principle. This was a Greek scientist, and the story has it was the king asked him to determine if his crown was made entirely of gold. 
So Archimedes, he knew that he just had to determine if the density of the crown matched the density of gold. And um, mass, like we've talked about before, you can measure that using a balance. To figure out the volume, because it was an irregularly, sh irregularly shaped crown, he couldn't just use, um, like for example, if it was a rectangular prism, you can just use length times width times height to figure out the volume. But a crown is not shaped that way. So to figure out the volume of the crown, he had to use this concept of water displacement. And what that is, is um, it's the water or the volume displaced. So the water that spills out is equal to the volume of the object. So what he found was that the crown was made of a mixture of gold and silver. It wasn't made completely of gold. Yeah, and you probably saw that on the brain pop on density as well. Um, see, so Archimedes, he also figured out that an object that's immersed in a fluid, such as water, does not rise or sink if the amount of force pulling down, that gravity, if it equals the amount of force pushing up, which is buoyancy. And that is neutral buoyancy when gravity equals buoyancy. So Archimedes' principle is that the buoyant force acting on an object equals the weight or the force of gravity of the fluid that's displaced by the object. Okay, I'm going to pause here. We have a couple of videos to watch on... Some of the best opportunities to learn are the moments in which we are perplexed, those moments in which you begin to wonder and question. These moments have happened throughout history and have led to some truly amazing discoveries. Take this story for example. There once was a fellow named Archimedes, who was born in 287 BC in the city of Syracuse in Sicily. He was a Greek mathematician, physicist, engineer, inventor, and astronomer. One day, Archimedes was summoned by the king of Sicily to investigate if he had been cheated by a goldsmith. The king said he had given a goldsmith the exact amount of gold needed to make a crown. However, when the crown was ready, the king suspected that the goldsmith cheated and slipped some silver into the crown, keeping some of the gold for himself. The king asked Archimedes to solve the problem, but there was a catch. He couldn't do any damage to the crown. One day, while taking his bath, Archimedes noticed that the water level in the bathtub rose and overflowed as he immersed himself into the tub. He suddenly realized that how much water was displaced depended on how much of his body was immersed. This discovery excited him so much that he jumped out of the tub and ran through the streets naked shouting, Eureka! Which comes from the ancient Greek meaning, I found it! What did he find? Well, he found a way to solve the king's problem. You see, Archimedes needed to check the crown's density to see if it was the same as the density of pure gold. Density is a measure of an object's mass divided by its volume. Pure gold is very dense, while silver is less dense. So if there was silver in the crown, it would be less dense than if it were made of pure gold. But no matter what it was made of, the crown would be the same shape, which means the same volume. So if Archimedes could measure the mass of the crown first, and then measure its volume, he could find out how dense it was. But it is not easy to measure crown's volume. It has an irregular shape that's different from a simple box or ball. You can't measure its sides and multiply like you might for other shapes. The solution, Archimedes realized, was to give the crown a bath. By placing it in water and seeing how much water was displaced, he could measure the volume. Then he'd calculate the density of the crown. If the crown was less dense than pure gold, then the goldsmith most definitely cheated the king. When Archimedes went back to the king and did his test, the story says, he found that the goldsmith had indeed cheated the king and slipped some silver in. These days, Using the way an object displaces water to measure volume is called Archimedes' Principle. The next time you take a bath, you can see Archimedes' Principle in action. And maybe you'll have a genius idea of your own. When you think of Archimedes' Eureka moment, you probably think of this. As it turns out, it may have been more like this. In the third century BC, Hieron, king of the Sicilian city of Syracuse, chose Archimedes to supervise an engineering project of unprecedented scale. Hieron commissioned a sailing vessel 
50 times bigger than a standard ancient warship. Named the Syracusia after his city, Chiron wanted to construct the largest ship ever, which was destined to be given as a present for Egypt's ruler, Ptolemy. But could a boat the size of a palace possibly float? In Archimedes' day, no one had attempted anything like this. It was like asking, can a mountain fly? King Hiron had a lot riding on that question. Hundreds of workmen were to labor for years on constructing the Syracusia out of beams of pine and fir from Mount Etna, ropes from hemp grown in Spain, and pitch from France. The top deck, on which eight watchtowers were to stand, was to be supported not by columns, but by vast wooden images of Atlas, holding the world on his shoulders. On the ship's bow, a massive catapult would be able to fire 180-pound stone missiles. For the enjoyment of its passengers, the ship was to feature a flower-lined promenade, a sheltered swimming pool, and bathhouse with heated water, a library filled with books and statues, a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, and a gymnasium. And just to make things more difficult for Archimedes, Chiron intended to pack the vessel full of cargo. 400 tons of grain, 10,000 jars of pickled fish, 74 tons of drinking water, and 600 tons of wool. It would have carried well over 1,000 people on board, including 600 soldiers and it housed 20 horses in separate stalls. To build something of this scale only for that to sink on its maiden voyage, well, let's just say that failure wouldn't have been a pleasant option for Archimedes. So he took on the problem. Will it sink? Perhaps he was sitting in the bathhouse one day, wondering how a heavy bathtub can float when inspiration came to him. An object partially immersed in a fluid is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. In other words, if a 2,000-ton Syracusia displaced exactly 2,000 tons of water, it would just barely float. If it displaced 4,000 tons of water, it would float with no problem. Of course, if it only displaced 1,000 tons of water, well, Chiron wouldn't be too happy. This is the law of buoyancy and engineers still call it Archimedes' principle. It explains why a steel supertanker can float as easily as a wooden rowboat or a bathtub. If the weight of water displaced by the vessel below the keel is equivalent to the vessel's weight, whatever is above the keel will remain afloat above the waterline. This sounds a lot like another story involving Archimedes and a bathtub, and it's possible that's because they're actually the same story, twisted by the vagaries of history. The classical story of Archimedes' Eureka and subsequent streak through the streets centers around a crown, or corona, in Latin. At the core of the Syracusia story is a keel, or corona, in Greek. Could one have been mixed up for the other? We may never know. On the day the Syracusia arrived in Egypt on its first and only voyage, we can only imagine how residents of Alexandria thronged the harbor to marvel at the arrival of this majestic floating castle. This extraordinary vessel was the Titanic of the ancient world, except without the sinking, thanks to our pal Archimedes. Um, so next, um, we're looking at how are buoyancy and density related. So. The buoyant force of a liquid, it doesn't depend on its physical state, it depends on density, right? So like we've talked about before with water compared to salt water, um, objects float more easily in salt water. For example, seawater has a density of 1.03 grams per milliliter and fresh water has a density of 1.00 grams per milliliter. Um, another device here, this is called a hydrometer. This is an instrument that is designed um, to measure liquid density. So what happens is if you put this hydrometer um, inside of a, a liquid, liquid um, it'll extend further out of a liquid if the density is higher. Um, and then it will sink lower if 
um, a liquid has a lower density. So here we're just comparing water. Water has the density of 1 grams per milliliter. Vegetable oil has a density of 0 0.9 grams per milliliter. All right, um, so we're going to stop here. Um, you guys are going to finish your assignment on density.